All righty. So like I said, we are pretty much done with biochemistry. So there's not a whole lot of other chemistry coming up, which is really nice. We're gonna go back to some kind of cellular stuff. So this unit is actually, I don't know, in my opinion, one of the more interesting ones, it's about genetics. So genetics are often of interest to people because it's kind of easy to uh, relate to. You know, you have, you know, characteristics from your mom and from your dad and how those all come together can be pretty fascinating. Um, we're going to start with a less exciting topic, but the basis of genetics essentially. So uh, this first section, which um, is actually really straightforward considering we already went over mitosis, is going to be about meiosis, a very similar yet slightly different uh, process for creating uh, gametes. And I'll talk about what those are. Okay. So what the heck is meiosis? It might sound familiar from like high school biology, mitosis and meiosis. So uh, meiosis, the whole purpose of this process is to create what we call gametes. Gametes are cells that are involved in sexual reproduction. So we're not talking about any asexually reproducing organisms like bacteria, just when most organisms are going to be sexually reproducing anyway. So we're talking about most of the others in the world. So for our purposes, if you want to think about it in a simpler term, gametes are sperm cells and egg cells. Those are gametes. And then the gametes will come together and fuse and what they form is a zygote. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute, basically a new person. So one cell, the very beginning of a new person is a zygote or a new whatever animal you're talking about. So meiosis, when we go through this process, we're making gametes, we're making these sperm cells and egg cells. Mitosis versus meiosis, uh, some similarities and uh, differences. The stages conveniently have the same names. So you have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and meiosis and mitosis. And it's in the same general order. So if you remember that same, that general order from mitosis, you're already kind of halfway through the process. And the same general things happen. There's a couple of special things that happen in meiosis that we'll talk about. The main difference is that, so mitosis just happened once, basically. So just one round. Meiosis, actually, if you start with one cell, it's going to undergo two rounds of division. So if you remember mitosis, we were splitting one cell into two, right? And those two cells in mitosis were identical. They were clones of each other. So final result of mitosis, two cells, the cells are identical, and they each had two copies of the DNA. With meiosis, the, the two cells that are originally formed then also undergo division, so you get four cells. So you have two rounds of division in meiosis. So you'll have prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, and then you'll have all of those again, but with a two after them. And we'll talk about those. So two rounds of division for meiosis, you end up with four cells. If we're starting with one, they divide into two, and then those two divide into two more. So we have four cells at the end. They each only have one copy of the DNA, and they are not identical to each other. So these are not cloned cells which is really important because if they were all the same, then every individual on the planet would be the exact same. So meiosis, a really important part of meiosis, the kind of special parts of meiosis that I'm gonna point out multiple times are going to increase genetic diversity. So that's a really important aspect of meiosis. 
if all of our cells just underwent mitosis and we are formed by mitosis, we'd all be the exact same because all of the cells would be the exact same. Meiosis adds that diversity in. Okay. Those are the main differences. Let's get into uh, some background. So I wanna start with a little bit of background on chromosomes before we get into the actual steps of meiosis. First, homologous pairs. So chromosomes have, for our purposes, we have a copy of our father's DNA and we have a copy of our mother's DNA. Each of those chromosomes have the same genes on them. So Here's where we're gonna get into like looking at specific genes and different alleles of genes, but a gene here, so this is gonna be say the, the mother's chromosome. This will be the father's chromosome. So paternal versus maternal. These little letters and like uh, in the spots on this chromosome are representing different uh, genes. So this, these little R's and big P's, those are a gene for something. So you can imagine maybe the R is for hair color. So big R, little R depends on which one you have. You could have brown hair, or blonde hair, or, you know, a multitude of other colors. This might be eye color. So a gene for eye color. So you have the same genes on the mother's chromosome and the father's chromosome, but they can be different forms of that gene, which is an allele. So an allele is just an alternate form of a gene. So if the gene is eye color, the alleles would be blue eye color and brown eye color or green eye color. So there's different forms of genes. That's how we get that genetic diversity. But when we're talking about homologous pairs of chromosomes, so homologous chromosomes, they're gonna have, their chromosomes that have the same genes on them. Even if they're not the same version of that gene, they have an eye color gene, they have a hair color gene, they have a height gene, all that kind of stuff. That's simplifying it. Some of those are a lot more complicated than one gene. They just have different versions of them. So the homologous chromosomes are going to be, you have one chromosome, or one set of genetic material from your father and one from your mother. Those are the homologs. And we'll talk more about this if this doesn't make perfect sense as we get into meiosis and then definitely as we get into um, some of the genetics like Punnett squares and all that kind of stuff, we'll talk about homologs again. Okay. So now two really important terms as we go through meiosis are haploid and diploid. So I mentioned that meiosis results in cells that only have one copy of DNA. The term for having one copy of DNA or one copy of each chromosome is haploid. And that is usually indicated by a little, little n. So if you see one little n, that means it's haploid, just one copy of the DNA. So yeah, right down, down here, I mentioned one copy of each gene. You know, like one copy of the hair color, eye color, all those different genes, there's only one copy of them in a haploid cell. In a diploid cell, as you might imagine, there's two copies. So we note, denote that as 2N. So if you see a 2N, that means there's two copies of each gene. Two copies of each gene in a cell, diploid. So here, if we look at these chromosomes, so the different length chromosomes, these are gonna be homologous pairs. So they have the same genes on them. They might just be different versions of those genes, but there's two copies of them, right? Two copies of each of these chromosomes, which means there's two copies of the genes that are found on each chromosome. So you can imagine just 
gene kind of lining all along the chromosomes here. So if you guys unzoom, I don't know if you could see that. So here we have two chromosomes with the exact same genes on them, but maybe different versions. That's why they're kind of different colors. Over here, only one copy of each of those chromosomes. At the end of meiosis, we end up with cells that only have one copy of the DNA, one copy of the chromosomes. So we end up with haploid cells. Yeah, okay. So haploid, diploid, you'll see those terms again. So the purpose of meiosis, as a reminder, is to create gametes, which are haploid cells. We're making gametes, which are those for, if we're relating it to humans, sperm cells and egg cells, the reproductive cells. An egg cell only has one copy of DNA, a sperm cell only has one copy of DNA. The types of cells that go through meiosis are called germline or reproductive cells. So these are diploid cells. So we're going from a diploid cell, the reproductive cell, and we're cutting the number of chromosomes in half, essentially, through meiosis to create the gametes. In mitosis, we just went from diploid to diploid. We didn't cut numbers of chromosomes or amount of DNA or anything. So that's the main difference. That's a big difference, I should say, between meiosis and mitosis. We're actually cutting out half the DNA. Let's talk briefly about what happens at the cellular level with sexual reproduction. So when I say sexual reproduction, this basically is just a reproduction that involves an alternation between meiosis and fertilization. So we're going back and forth between we're creating haploid cells, those two are joining and we're creating a diploid cell. And then some of those cells will go through meiosis. You create haploid cells, those fuse again, form diploid cells. So we'll go through this um, based on this diagram down here. So we're kind of alternating between haploid and diploid. So yeah, two haploid cells are gametes. Those are gonna be sperm and egg. So haploid sperm, haploid egg, they only have one copy of DNA each. They're what's created by a meiosis, which we just talked about. We'll talk about how that's done in a minute. But we'll imagine we've already gone through meiosis. These are the results of meiosis in a female and a male. Right, so separate people, obviously. So if you combine a sperm and an egg, that's called fertilization, and you get a diploid zygote. If you have one cell that has a copy, one copy of DNA, another cell that has one copy of DNA, you put those together, now you're back up to two copies of DNA in that cell. So that's why it's diploid. And you can see in this diagram, there's the paternal DNA and the maternal DNA. So the, the mother's and the father's DNA have come together into one cell. Whereas before fertilization, they were separate. So we all started life as one single cell. We were one little cell that divided a whole lot of times into what we are now, into trillions of cells. So this cell is then gonna undergo mitosis basically and make more of itself. So all the cells in your body, except for the reproductive cells, all of the somatic cells like your skin cells, hair, liver, heart, they all have your father's DNA and your mother's DNA in them. Because they all basically started from this one cell that just, then just divided over and over and those cells divided over and over. 
so on and so forth until you have a fully created, fully developed human being. So here's something to think about. Why can't gametes, so the, the sperm and the egg, why can't they have two copies of DNA and just undergo mitosis so we don't have to deal with meiosis because they're created via meiosis, right? So why can't they just have two copies of DNA? What would be the issue there if sperm cells and egg cells had two copies each? So it's Kind of, yeah. So they when they fuse, you'd have double the amount of chromosomes, right? So with each time, each time a sperm and egg would fuse together to fertilize, you'd be doubling the amount of chromosomes. So we have an insane number of chromosomes basically in our bodies. So we have to, in order to keep the same number of chromosomes, which is um, 46 in humans, we have 46 chromosomes in pretty much all of our cells. In order to keep that number the same, we have to cut them in half each time in order to create a new human because you have two individual haploid cells fusing together. So if you have two cells fusing together and say they're diploid, so they have two copies of DNA, when they fuse together, you'd have four copies of the DNA. And then you'd, you wouldn't be able to basically keep the same number of chromosomes. And an incorrect or... Um, Irregular number of chromosomes can cause issues um, from a, a genetic standpoint. So we want the same number of chromosomes. We want 46 chromosomes. So yeah, it's an issue if you're just if you just keep doubling the chromosomes each time, that is going to overload our cells essentially with chromosomes. So we have to we have the doubling um, during fertilization, then we have to cut that in half again before fertilization can happen again. Okay, so yeah, that's just basic, yeah, kind of basic math, thinking about it from a, a chromosomal standpoint. All right, so overview of meiosis. We have interphase, just like we had in mitosis. This is where the chromosomes are duplicated. So uh, DNA is replicated, synthesized, duplicated, however you want to say it, uh, in interphase, just like it was with the cell cycle when we talked about it before, when we were dealing with mitosis. So chromosome duplication before meiosis actually starts. Meiosis one happens before meiosis two, obviously, that's convenient. In meiosis one, and I'll go through these two stages, I'll really go through meiosis one in detail and the meiosis two is kind of the same thing again. But meiosis one involves the homologous chromosomes separating. And I'll show you what that looks like. That means chromosomes that have the same genes on them will separate into different cells. Meiosis two, if you remember what a chromatid is, if you think of one of these chromosomes, the X shape, each of these is a chromatid, just as a reminder. So one chromatid on one side, chromatid on the other side. So this is a chromatid here for you guys on Zoom, and then this is also a chromatid. So two chromatids stuck together at this stage. Those are what are gonna separate in meiosis two. So meiosis two, the sister chromatids separate. So you don't have this X shape anymore in the chromosome. Those two pieces separate and go into different cells. So here we're starting with, um, well here, we'll start here. Um, we're starting with a diploid cell that has two copies of DNA. And then we're ending with four cells with only one copy of DNA.
Okay, so let's talk about, like I said, I'm going to talk in detail about meiosis one. Um, meiosis two, I'm basically going to just say it's basically meiosis one, but the chromatids are separating rather than homologous chromosomes. There's some really important steps that happen or events that happen in meiosis one, sort of at the beginning in prophase and metaphase. Those are the two big stages of meiosis where genetic diversity is introduced. So remember, we're not just cloning cells. We're actually mixing up the DNA during sexual reproduction. So we're not exact clones of our parents or one of our parents. We have a mixture of characteristics from both of them. And this is where that happens, partially, prophase one. Okay, so what happens in prophase one? The homologous chromosomes are gonna pair up. So they'll find each other. So here we'll imagine the blue is the paternal, uh, the father's DNA, red will be the mother's DNA. Those two chromosomes that have the same genes on them from the dad and from the mom are gonna find each other and pair up. So here for you guys on Zoom, the blue will be the father's DNA, red will be the mother's DNA. They'll come together and form, um, so the pairing up is called synapsis. And what forms is called a tetrad. Tetra means four, so four individual chromatids is what that's referring to. So there's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, two chromosomes, but four chromatids. That makes a tetrad. So they find each other and pair up. It has to be homologous chromosomes. So they have to have the same genes on them. Again, maybe different versions. Maybe the father has um, a gene for brown hair color and the mother has a gene for blonde hair color, but they have to have the same genes on those chromosomes. Those are the chromosomes that'll pair up with each other. And then a really cool event happens where those chromosomes switch and trade DNA with each other. And that's called crossing over. So homologous chromosomes are exchanging little segments with each other. So you can see the crossing over process here. So they're little, I don't know what you want to call them, arms or legs of the chromosomes actually cross over and then they switch segments. So here you have some of the mother's DNA now on what was the father's chromosome and then vice versa, the father's DNA on the mother's chromosome. So those are switched. This is why they have to be homologous chromosomes. <laughs> they have to have the same genes switching with each other, right? If these were different chromosomes and had different genes on them, then some of the cells wouldn't have genes for say hair color if they switched and they weren't both containing hair color genes, for instance. So they have to, have the, they have to switch the same sections which have the same genes on them. They'll just mix up the variety of those genes. Okay, so yeah, adding genetic diversity. Circle that and highlight it and underline it and know that it happens during crossing over and that that happens during prophase one. The sites where they cross over are called chiasmata. So just another term, but this area here where you have the recombination are called the chiasmata. All right, in addition to that, just like with prophase in mitosis, the nuclear membrane starts to break down. The nucleus is where all the DNA is. So it has to break down in order for the DNA to separate to either sides of the cell because eventually we're gonna slice the cell in two. But what you wanna remember from prophase one is the crossing over, well, the synapsis as well as the crossing over, but crossing over I'll definitely ask you guys about. That's one huge, point at which we add genetic diversity to a species. And metaphase one is the second place where we add some diversity. So genetic diversity is really introduced in meiosis in prophase one and metaphase one right at the beginning. So what's happening here? Metaphase, if you remember from 
Mitosis is where the chromosomes line up along the midline of the cell. So the same thing is happening here. We kind of have double the amount of DNA because we have um, the mother's chromosome and the father's chromosome, right? So we have these tetrads. So the tetrads are what are lining up along the midline. And then like in mitosis, these microtubules are gonna attach, which are the, the lines here. These are the tracts essentially on which the chromosomes will move to either end of the cell. So they'll be pulled apart again, just like they were in mitosis. The microtubules attaching to the kinetochores, which is just the center of the chromosome here, is happening during metaphase one. And the genetic diversity aspect that's being introduced here is based on the fact that these chromosomes can line up, um, they line up in a random fashion. So when they pair up, here we have the father's chromosome on the left and the mother's on the right. So father's left, mother's right. It could just as easily be the opposite. So here the mother's, the mother's chromosome could be on the left and the father's on the right. So for you guys on Zoom, the blue is on the left, red is on the right. The opposite could be, it's just as equally likely to happen. And that is called independent assortment. They're independently um, assorting. <laughs> They're independently lining up along the midline. It's not like the father's DNA has to be on the left and the mom's has to be on the right. They might be flipped. So it's a 50-50 shot as to how they line up. Why does that matter? Because these in anaphase are gonna be pulled apart. So in this case, the father's DNA on this, um, in this scenario, this tetrad up here, will be pulled, pulled to the cell that will eventually develop on the left and the mothers will end up on the right. If we flipped them, it would be different cells, right? Especially when we take into account there's other chromosomes that are doing the same thing. So the fact that all of these tetrads can line up you have a 50-50 shot of them lining up a certain way, they're all gonna get mixed up. It's not like all the father's DNA is gonna be in one cell and all the mother's in the other. It's totally like a random mix. So a random assortment. Okay, so now anaphase the tetrads are separating. So one tetrad will go to one side of the cell, the other or one part of a tetrad, sorry, one half, basically a chromosome will go to one side of the cell. The chromosome on the other side will go to the other side of the cell. So the homologous chromosomes are separating. That's, if you break it down, like I said on the, overview slide of meiosis. This is what's happening in meiosis one. Homologous chromosomes are separating. After they've done some other stuff, crossing over, um, assorting independently along the midline. But this is the goal of meiosis one, to separate those homologous chromosomes. And you still have the sister chromatids attached. So you have that typical chromosome shape with two chromatids per chromosome. All right, so who remembers what the last stage would be here after anaphase? Telophase. Telophase, yep, exactly. So telophase and cytokinesis, we are just separating cells basically. So the homologous chromosomes are going to make their way all the way to the ends of this soon to be divided cell. And then the cell splits in two, that's the cytokinesis part. And at the end, you have two cells, right? So we started with one, we've only gone through one round of division. So we have two cells and they're haploid. So they only have one copy of each chromosome. Okay. 
One chromosome went to one cell, the other chromosome went to the other cell. So now each of these only has one copy of each chromosome. So that makes them haploid. And that's the end of meiosis one. Meiosis two, like I said, pretty simple and straightforward. Um, I didn't even go into a ton of detail. I have a diagram here if it's helpful to you to see meiosis two, but you just go through all the phases again, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, but they're all twos. There's nothing special about adding genetic diversity in this round. Yes. Okay, so is it like prophase two with a prophase? Uh, prophase. First phase and then go through the second. Yes, exactly. So you go through prophase one first, and then, well, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase one, and then you go prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase two. Yes. So prophase two, um, well, the second round of meiosis, basically we're just trying to separate the sister chromatids now. So we have those chromosomes that are this typical X shape. Now we wanna separate each side of those X's. So we wanna pull those X's apart. So for you guys on Zoom, we have this typical X shape. Um, the goal of meiosis two is to separate those chromatids from each other. So split those X's in two. So you have at the end, just individual chromatids. Um, so not a lot is happening actually in prophase two. Metaphase, you get the lining up along the midline, just like every other metaphase we've talked about. Anaphase, that's where those X's get split in two. The chromatids move to either side of the cell. So anaphase, the chromatids are moving to either side of the cell. You can see kind of where this is going. Telophase and cytokinesis too. So that's where you have the actual splitting of the cell. So we had two, right? We had two cells coming into meiosis two. That was the result of meiosis one. Each of those is gonna split into two cells. So you have four at the end. Each of those only has one copy of DNA, so still haploid. Final result, four haploid cells. Those are the gametes. Good, do you guys have any questions about meiosis too? I know I kind of breezed through it, but it's essentially the same as, in a lot of ways, as mitosis. Because you have the, you don't have those complicated tetrads that you have to separate. We've already done that in mitosis one. Okay. I'm not gonna go through these diagrams. If these are helpful to you, I put them in here. This is from, uh, I'm pretty sure from your textbook. It might be from another textbook. I can't remember where I got it. But this details the different stages. Here's meiosis one. So you have, well, interphase and then uh, prophase with the tetrads lining up or pairing up. Metaphase where they line up along the midline anaphase where they get pulled apart. So this is just kind of a different view of it. Like I said, if it's helpful, I know it has kind of a lot of detail on it, but some people like a little bit more detail. Um, and then meiosis two. So we're gonna end meiosis one with two cells. Each of those will then split, or sorry, each of well, they will split, but each of those will then undergo meiosis two and split again at the end. Uh, so let's watch the Amoeba Sisters video of this. This is a good kind of review of what I just talked about, essentially. Oops.
insurance, we offer instant, free, and unlimited certificates of insurance. You don't need to hear that. All have you ever wondered how two siblings can have the same mom and dad and still look so different? Well, today we're going to talk about a process that makes that possible, a process called meiosis. Not to be confused with mitosis, which sounds unfortunately similar. Mitosis makes identical body cells, like your skin cells and stomach cells. Recall from our mitosis clip that since it makes identical body cells, mitosis is important for growth and for repair of damage or to replace worn out cells, but not meiosis. Meiosis is a process that contributes to genetic variety. Meiosis also doesn't make body cells. It makes sperm and egg cells, otherwise known as gametes, the fancier word. You might recall that humans have 46 chromosomes. That's how many chromosomes most body cells in your body have. But there are some human cells that don't have 46 chromosomes. Human sperm cells and egg cells have 23 chromosomes. Why the number difference? Well, if a sperm cell has 23 chromosomes and an egg cell has 23 chromosomes, when they come together, that makes 46 chromosomes. That will allow a newly formed fertilized egg to develop into a human. Meiosis is what we call a reduction division because you have a starting cell that has 46 chromosomes and your ending cell, the sperm and egg cells, have only 23 chromosomes. Before we can start getting into the stages of meiosis to make gametes, we have to remember what happens before meiosis can even start. Actually, this also happens before mitosis. It's the stage known as interphase. And if you remember interphase, it's when the cell is growing, it's replicating its DNA, it's carrying out cell processes. And just like mitosis, interphase happens before meiosis is even going to start. So the starting cell has 46 chromosomes, and you have to duplicate those chromosomes in interphase before meiosis starts. That basically means you are duplicating your DNA since chromosomes are made of DNA and protein. Ready for the tricky part? Well, because we tend to count chromosomes by the number of centromeres present, when the 46 chromosomes... So this gets confusing. Don't worry too much about the how we count chromosomes. Um, if you're really confused about the count in here, they have a really good video that explains it. Um, so I'm just gonna let this play, but don't stress if you're like, what the heck are they talking about? Let's duplicate. We still say there are 46 chromosomes because the sister chromatids are still attached and we're actually counting by centromeres. So 46 chromosomes here, they replicate in interphase and you still have 46 chromosomes in this picture, but you went from 46 to 92 chromatids. A little tricky there. We have a detailed video that explains these chromosome numbers before and after replicating an interface that can be useful for meiosis. Okay, so interface checklist done. Now we can move into meiosis. You might remember the mitosis stages PMAT. The P was for prophase, the M was for metaphase, the A for anaphase, and the T for telophase. And the good news is that in meiosis, you still use those terms. But because meiosis is actually a reduction division, you're going from 46 chromosomes to 23, which means you actually divide twice. So instead of mitosis, where you divide one time and do PMAT one time, in meiosis, you're going to divide twice and therefore do PMAT twice. And because of this, in meiosis, you put numbers after the phases to indicate whether you're in the first division or the second division. So let's dive right in. So let's start with the very first step, prophase one. One thing I like to remember about prophase is pro, this actually means before, and it kind of helps you remember that it comes before all the other stages start. This is where the chromosomes are going to condense and thicken. They are actually going to line up with their homologous pairs. The word homologous means that the chromosomes are approximately the same size and they contain the same types of genes in the same locations. They're going to match up. It is during this prophase one that this amazing process occurs called crossing over. Now I know crossing over probably sounds like something very different, but this is actually a really awesome process because this is when the chromosomes, they're lined up in homologous pairs and they have this way that they can transfer their genetic information and exchange it between each other. It's kind of like these chromosomes flop over each other and they do a little genetic information exchange here. It makes for what we call recombinant chromosomes. 
which can eventually contribute to the variety that we were mentioning that siblings can have even when they have the same parents. More about that later. Now we move into metaphase one. In metaphase one, think of the N as standing for middle. The chromosomes are now going to be in the middle of the cell. It's a little bit different though from mitosis because these chromosomes are gonna be in pairs in the middle of the cell. So it's not a single file line, they're in pairs in the middle. Now during anaphase one, think of A for away because the chromosomes are going to be pulled away by the spindle fibers. Then we end with telophase one, where you have two newly formed nuclei, and it becomes obvious that you're going to end meiosis one with two new cells. Cytokinesis follows with splitting the cytoplasm, but we're not done yet. On to meiosis two. The very first step in meiosis two is prophase two. It's not gonna be nearly as eventful as it was in prophase one though, because they're not gonna have homologous pairs of chromosomes they also are not going to have this amazing process called crossing over. That doesn't happen again in prophase two. You have your chromosomes and the spindles are starting to form like they did in prophase one, but prophase two is just not as eventful of having that process of crossing over. In metaphase two, remember, think M for middle, the chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. This time though, they are in a single file line. They are not in pairs like they were in metaphase one. Anaphase two, remember A for away, but this time it's the chromatids that are going to be pulled away by the spindle fibers. In telophase two, you can see the nuclei reforming, and you can also see that the two cells have divided. There's going to be four cells forming. Cytokinesis will follow to completely split the cytoplasm. Now, keep in mind that meiosis in males produces sperm cells, and in females it produces egg cells. Because of independent assortment and also crossing over, you're going to have variety. For example, in a male, the four sperm cells that are produced each time, they are all different from each other. They're also different from the starting cell because the starting cell had 46 chromosomes and the ending cells only had 23. So they are not identical to the original and they are not identical to each other. This is gonna to lead to variety, a reason why two siblings with the same parents can look different from each other. They still developed from a unique egg and a unique sperm cell that came together. One last thing to think about. Scientists are often looking into the process of meiosis because sometimes the chrom Okay, we'll stop there. I'm going to talk about some issues with meiosis on Friday, but our time is up. So I'll see you guys then.